Matthew chapter 18, the Matthew 18 principle. We're zeroing in on verse 15. We've covered uh, things like uh, if your brother, you identify before you confront, you identify who it is that's offended you. If he sins, you identify what it is, how serious is this offense. There's a difference between sin and your personal preference. And we also talked about uh, against you, if your brother sins against you as opposed to somebody else. And we talked about guarding your ears and what you choose to listen to. And at the end of that service two Sundays ago, we asked for everybody to stand who was willing to commit to those three principles. And we all stood together. You remember that? Are you awake? Is, do we need to bring some coffee from the cafe? Last Sunday, we talked about committing ourselves to gravitate to the right process. If your brother sins against you, go. And it's not the person who's offended. It's the person who's been offended. Has to take the first step in healing. Take the first step of responsibility. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took the first step. He calls us to take the first step. If your brother sins against you, uh, go show him. You don't go to your best bud. You go to the person that's offended you. Hardest principle I have ever seen Christians practice. Even harder than tithing. And, and tithing's hard to practice. To, to go to the right person and resist the temptation to go to your best bud, unload on him, and get affirmed in all your negative thinking. That's not Matthew 18. We committed, we committed uh, to take the first step to go to the right person, guard our tongues, watch out for gossip, watch out for slander, and then get to the right problem, the right issue. Don't pretend that everything's hunky-dory even when you go to that person. And, and make sure that the attitude of your heart matches the, the look on your face. And we talked about uh, being authentic and taking off that plastic religious mask that God hates. And we committed to it. Do you remember that? We committed to it as a church. And this isn't an accident that this series comes at the very beginning of a school year. I'm, I'm challenging us to practice it at school. At work, in our communities, in our marriages. I don't think I have ever been more aware right now of the need for Matthew 18 in our homes. Between moms and dads and sons and daughters. It's killing us. The hate that's out there in, 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 in our world politically is just, give me a break, are you kidding me? If there was ever a time for Christians to step up and show a difference. This is how Christians handle their conflict with integrity. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to commit to three more principles of phase one. I tell you guys, you want to live in phase one. You don't want to go to phase two of the Matthew 18 principle, and you don't want to ever go to phase three because the stakes get higher. 90, 95% of our conflict should be handled in phase one. But for the rest of that, about 5% of that, there are two other phases we're going to talk about. Before we go there, we got about a, a phrase and a half left of, of Matthew 18, 15 that we're going to jump into. I want you to write this down. Three more principles I'm going to ask you to commit to. Number one, make sure you confront. When it's time to confront, Make sure you confront at the right place. This is huge. Make sure you confront at the right place. And there's a phrase toward the end of verse 15 that says, just between what? The two of you. Just between the two of you. Now, I'm going to actually take that phrase and I'm going to pull out two biblical principles from the same phrase. And the first principle is make sure you confront in the right place. There is no such thing as constructive confronting that has been done publicly. It doesn't exist. Even if you have been offended and maybe even embarrassed publicly, you confront 
privately. It's huge. Absolutely huge. You don't, you don't hide behind letters, especially unsigned letters. If you have ever sent a confronting non-signed letter, I don't want to hear about it. So I'm going to get on your case like ugly on an ape. Nothing more cowardly than to send an unsigned confronting letter. Give me a, it's like hitting a blind man right between his eyes. I don't even hear about it. No, no letters, no phone calls, no third party hiding behind some third party messenger. No Facebook. Give me a break, guys. Give me a break. Are you kidding me? I don't even read Facebook and I hear about what some of some brothers and sisters in the Lord put on Facebook. Are you kidding me? For the whole world to see? We can do better than this. We can have more integrity than this. When you confront, you confront face to face. Not through the computer, through the phone, through email, through a third party friend. Face to to face. If you can't do it face to face, then it ought to roll off your back like we talked about two weeks ago and walk off. Either get it done or walk off. But none of this in between pity poor me stuff. Good preaching, John. Good preaching. Oh. Just feel the warmth in this room. Oh. Warm and fuzzy, kissy poo, huggy poo. Before I came here, back home in Indiana in my home church, I was on staff as a minister of evangelism, discipleship, and it's my job trained people how to share their faith. And we did it uh, every Wednesday, Thursday night. We'd send out both nights, 40, 50 teams, three, three people a team. We'd send out 50, 60 people uh, uh, both nights. And then there was a day team that we went out. And then on the weekends, we'd go to other churches that would invite us to bring our, our layman with us, and we'd train their layman. So we'd go, out, we'd go out seven, eight times a week for six years. We had so many people wanting to learn how to share their faith that we ran out of prospects. We'd, we'd call on these prospects, prospect cards, people who visited our church. We had more people calling, uh, going out, than we had people to call on. So we took this huge, huge step of faith. And we decided to send these prospect cards aside, and we were, we were just going to go cold turkey, door to door. You know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. We're going to act like a bunch of cultists, you know what I mean? But with the gospel. And I said, you take this block, you take this block, you take this block. All I want you to do is go around, knock on a door, tell them who you're from. Just be transparent. I'm John Ott, and this is, this is uh, Glenn Augerbright, and this is Jeannie. And uh, we're from Lakeview Church, and we're just here to kind of visit with the people in this area. Wanted to visit with you. Got any, got any time? We'd just like to sit down, talk with you, ask you a couple questions. If they say no, no problem. We go to the next house. They say yes, you come in. And then we had a, a way of kind of guiding and directing in a, in a non-confrontal way and get them to the point of asking about their faith. And it, it was when we would send out, when we made this shift from those terrible cards to this cold turkey stuff, we send out 20 teams. 18 would get in a home that night. 18 of the 20 would get in a home. And half of them would lead somebody to Christ, half the teams would come back with decisions for Christ. And, and the, the ministry and the touching of the hurt went through the roof. It's unbelievable the hurt out there, guys. I mean, some of you have been Christians so long, you don't really have a connection with, with out there. I am telling you, there are people dying out there. There are people who would love to have the hope you have. I mean, in Roanoke, this is not in the notes, and I should not go down this rabbit trail. But I am telling you, we play musical chairs around here like nobody's business. Whoever's got the best show has the best crowd. And all the Christians gravitate through the years, wherever the best show is. And the unchurched just keep growing and growing and growing. I remember I was, some of you would remember Janetta, Pastor Janetta. She was our children's, first children's pastor and first executive pastor of our church here in Roanoke. Um, she was on staff there. Her dad was my senior pastor. Her dad was my mentor. And if you knew Janetta, if you remember Janetta, she never knew a stranger. She was Miss, Miss Energy and Miss Personality, and she'd go up and 
you know, whether they say sell ice to an Eskimo or something like that. And she, she wanted to learn how to share her faith, her and her husband. And so they were on my team. We always went in teams of three. Uh, one man and two women, or two women and one man. You never went with three men. You never went with three women because they were always too intimidating for somebody to, to open their door. And we'd always have one that was a trainer and two that were trainees. And uh, you start off the semester of 16 weeks, and you start off, and the trainer would do the whole call. And these other two, they just sit back and watch the trainer. And then as the semester rolls on, you give them a little bit more and a little bit more responsibility in the call until about halfway through, they're doing the whole call, and I'm sitting back and watching, okay? So we're, we're about halfway through the semester. It's Pastor Jeanetta's turn to take the whole call. And she's chomping at the bit. Everybody else is scared stiff and their knees are knocking. She's chomping at the bit. And, and, and through all this um, uh, cold turkey stuff, it, you, the biggest fear the biggest fear is you go up and someone, a boogeyman, you always think there's a boogeyman behind that door. There's a boogeyman behind that and he's going to get me, you know. And they open the door. In, 20, in, in, uh, in six years, going out seven times a week, I never had one boogeyman jump out and go, Boo! Now, there were a couple of times when the door opened and I saw who was behind it. I went, oh! <laughs> this time, Jenna goes up, knocks on the door, no answer. Knocks on the door, no answer. We had a rule, three times you're out. You always knock three times. Third time you knock, door slowly opens, and, and behind it is this six foot four, 300 pound factory worker from Fisher Body that. Uh, work the graveyard shift. And we just, we just woke him up in the middle of his, his night. And he's in this t-shirt, hair hanging over his white t-shirt. He's got a Bud Light in one hand, a lit cigar in the other. He's only got two hairs on his head, both of them messed up. And in a rough, gruff voice, he says, yeah, what do you want? And Jeanette just missed Bubbly Janetta. She said, I'm Janetta Hera. This is my husband, Gilbert. This is John Hahn. We're from Lakeview Church. We just wanted to come and visit for you. And, and, and she gives him the spill. And when he hears why he's been awakened in the middle of his night, he starts applying pressure to that Bud Light until it pops like a, like a volcano. His, cigarette, his, his cigar is in his mouth and he swallows it. And it's lit. And he proceeds to tell us where we can go, how we can get there, and offers his assistance. And all of a sudden, guys, all of a sudden it's like the rapture happened. I was in the back watching Janetta go, and all of a sudden, poof, I'm alone. I look around, everybody who was ahead of me is now behind me. And Jeanette is up behind, standing behind me, and she's whispering in my ear, and she says, Go get him, Pastor John. Go get him. Sick him. Ask him if he died tonight, would he go to hell? You know? I said, Quiet, woman. You're going to get us killed, you know? Now, it ended well. It ended well. We didn't get in, we didn't get in that home. We went to the next home. But it's so easy when you're scared. It's scary to confront. Even, you're so sure there's a boogeyman behind the door. And it's so easy to hide behind other people or other things. But there's a lot at risk. And for those of you who have enough backbone to keep your Christian integrity if there's something that has happened that can't roll off your back, you've tried, you've tried to move, it doesn't seem to go away, it's affected the relationship, then for you to keep your integrity and practice Matthew 18, it means you go to somebody face to face. Don't hide behind other things or other people. Kind of scary, isn't it? Not only go to the right place, but when you confront, go at the right time. Absolutely huge. And I'm dealing with the same phrase. Just between the two of you not only implies personal, but you know what else? It, it implies private. 
private. It's like I said a little earlier, got ahead of myself. There's no such thing as confronting publicly. Not in a constructive way. Even if you've been embarrassed publicly, you confront privately. Absolutely huge. It's huge for your marriage. It's huge for your family. It's huge for your community. It's huge for your work. And guys, it's huge for your church. You know, it's just, I shouldn't go this way. I didn't go this way first hour. I don't know why I feel impressed to go on these tangents with you guys. But I'll go a little bit, just a little down this road. You know what just kind of bless my heart? This, oh, it just makes me feel so warm. And somebody up in the mystery comes to me about two minutes before I'm supposed to come to the platform. Oh, it just feels so warm for me. You know, or, or just right after the message. And there's a long line of people that some of them are crying with tears coming. And someone comes up and says, I'm ticked about something. You didn't care enough to make an appointment. Didn't care enough to try to set up a time. Just come on. Oh, that just warms your pastor's heart. Do it at the right time. Do it privately. There's another tangent. I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to go here. I was reading the paper. I read the paper every morning, Monday through Friday. I hardly ever read it. I never read it Sunday. Saturday sometimes. But Friday I was reading the paper and uh, came here afterwards. I'm about the only one here on Fridays, Glenn and I. And uh, it's just a catch-up to get ready for today. And I'm lost in my thoughts. And all of a sudden I, I read something in the paper. I said, i got to have that. And I went running back to the uh, restaurant grabbed the newspaper, and I, and I wrote down, did any of you read the paper this Friday about a softball game? I'm not, uh, no, it's a baseball game, junior, junior varsity baseball game. I, should, I'm think, I don't even think I'm going to tell you the schools because we're a little close here, and there might be some family here somewhere. But, but there was this, it, obviously there was a contentious game. Uh, I think it was 6-5, to five, so it was a close game. And I don't know what happened. The, the, the newspaper didn't say what happened. But at the end of the game, the coach of the one team was walking over to the coach of the other team to confront him, and he was under a, you know, a thundercloud. And, and the wife of the coach that's going over, he sees him going over, and she's, she thinks he's either going to attack him or he's going to get attacked. And so her excuse, this is a terrible excuse, I think she's just ticked. But, but she, she takes matters in her own hands, goes running out on the field, goes running out on the field, stands on the pitching mound, turns to the other team's fans... And moons them. 57 year old <laughs> wife of the other coach turns around, drops her drawers, and moves. In fact, the article was called Moon Over, but I'm not going to tell you where because then you'd know. <laughs> I read that and I said, guys, that's not exactly Matthew 18, okay? That's, that's not exactly, you know, practicing the Matthew 18 principle. And at the end, I, I wrote this down because it was, it was probably one of the most classic understatements I've read in quite a while. Uh, the one name I will give you, his name is Chris Robinson. He was a high school athletic director before he became, for 14 years, so he's been around the barn, before he became the assistant director of the Virginia High School League. This is the statement at the end of the, this little article. This is the statement he says. He says, uh, my sense is that that crowd behavior at high school games is probably leaning a little bit in the wrong direction. What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> that, that is not Matthew 18. Back in the day, when the girls were young, uh, we would play these great games. I remember we played dog pound. You guys ever played dog pound? Where the, the sofa is base and the love seat is base, but in between is free game, you know? And I'm the god dog catcher, and if I catch them between those two bases, I tickle them till they scream. It's a great game. And, and we played a game where I laid on my back with my knees up, and they'd be coming running at me, and I would catch their shoulders with, with my hands, and I'd flip them in the midair, and they'd go over head over heels, and they'd land most of the time on a, on a, on a soft pillow. Once in a while, we'd miss the pillow. But most of the time, they'd land on this soft pillow. And then there was this game that we would play where I was face down on the floor. Uh, in the, all of our games were in the living room. And they would try to keep me down while I was trying to get up. 
I, I forget what you call that game. But uh, they would jump on me and they'd pull me and I'd, I would try to get up. And we were, we were playing that game with a bunch of guests. Our house was, we had some house guests. And I was about to get up. I was about to win. And Stephanie, my oldest, who is the most competitive of the three, uh, she was going to have nothing of that. And so she gets back as far back as she can go. She's got this look. You know, Steph had this look of death, you know. And she was going to give me my, her best shot. And she was running full head of steam to knock me back down. But just before she got there, Alicia, my youngest, got in her way. And as she's running, she takes that girl by both hands and she flings her across the room. Alicia's flying through the air and runs into our TV console. Bam! You know, and it's like a basketball hitting the back, a backboard. You know, ricochets off. She's laying on her back looking. She's so shocked she doesn't even cry. We're all shocked. I mean, it sounded worse than it was. But man, when, when she hit that thing and fell back, we're all just going, you know. We're wondering, is she alive, you know. And, and, and eventually, you know, she starts, ah! And in that second, in that second of fear, I turned to Steph and I, and, I, and I reacted and I said, Stephanie, I can't believe you did that. I will never forget her look. I will never forget. Do you know where her eyes went when I nailed her? Do you know where her eyes instinctively went? They turned to look at our guests because I just blew her out of the water in front of our guests. And a little lip goes out and starts to quiver and tears start coming down because Daddy just broke her heart. Alicia wasn't dead. <laughs> she wasn't even bleeding. In five or six minutes, she was back running around, had a pretty good knot. That's about the extent of it. But the wound that I put on Steph's heart lasted a little longer than that. And I had to go. And I had to apologize. I said, Daddy, Daddy's wrong. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? Confronting publicly is out of bounds. There's nothing constructive about it. Confronting biblically is always done face to face and in private. Are we okay? Write this down. Do it at the right place. Do it at the right time. Number three, this is absolutely huge. Do it for the right reason. Just between the two of you, if, huge word, if, because there's no guarantees with Matthew 18, you could do it all right and it still not turn out the way you want to. If, if your brother listens to you, then you have what? You've won your brother over. Guys, listen to your pastor. Veterans who've been around the barn, who've actually done Matthew 18 with integrity, they always go for win-win. They never go for win-lose. Not in phase one. In phase one, you always go for win-win. You, you never do Matthew 18 to win the argument. You never do Matthew 18 to carry the day, to be the man. You never do Matthew 18 to attack. Listen, 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 guys. There is a world of difference between confronting biblically and attacking you got to be able to do the one without ever doing the other. There's a world of difference between Matthew 18 and defending 
yourself. You do Matthew 18 for the sole purpose of winning and healing the relationship. I told you back in, uh, on Father's Day two months ago, uh, I was going down the list of men who've modeled fatherhood for me and, and manhood for me and told you about my dad and I told you about Pastor Cockrell, who's the only pastor uh, I knew f- for several years in my life and only two within, you know, I graduated from college only knowing two pastors in my life. And uh, I told you at that time about a, a conflict, a head button between my dad and my pastor. This was after the accident. It was after mom and dad were taken in an accident. The pastor stopped me and told me, I want to share something with you you might not have never uh, have heard of. And I, I shared with you on Father's Day how in the early days they were building the footers. They were down in a ditch, literally, laying the footers. And I don't know what they were talking about, but I told you about how they got their wires crossed. They had this argument. And dad, in the early days, before I knew him, uh, before I came along, had kind of a short fuse. And, and he says to pastor, well, if that's the way it's going to be, I'm out of here. And he gets up and goes home. He's going to quit, going to leave the church. And I told you how Pastor Cockrell uh, got out of the ditch. He didn't go to his DS. He didn't go to his wife. He didn't go to his best bud. He went home. He cleaned up. He got his suit on, went straight to our house. And I was, I was in the living room when this happened. I saw it. Guys, I'm going to tell you, you never know who's watching. You never know who's watching. All of a sudden, there's this knock on the door. And Dad comes out of the back room, and he opens the door. It's Pastor Cockrell. Drops his jaw. And he says, Elman, can I come in? And, and Dad, Dad was a big man. He wasn't tall, but he was muscular. And He steps back, and Pastor comes in. And I watched it. I saw it, and I heard it. And uh, I heard Pastor say, Elman... I take full responsibility for that disagreement. I want you to forgive me. I'm so sorry. I want you to come back and get in the trench with me. Big old tears starts falling down my dad's cheeks. His heart was broken. No preacher had ever done that before. No preacher had ever shown that humility before. It changed his world. And that solidified a friendship that lasted until Pastor Cockrell put my dad in the grave. I don't think I'd be standing here in front of you if that hadn't happened, if I hadn't seen that, if I hadn't seen a mature Christian practicing Matthew 18. I I think I'd be doing something else. I don't know what I'd be doing, but I doubt that I would have been a minister. Last year, every day uh, except Sunday, I, I eat breakfast at Famous A's. And there's a group of people, none of them, hardly any of them, some of them, but uh, hardly any of them go to this church. But they're a part of the community. And I've been eating there <laughs> over 20 years. And so there's almost like a breakfast club. And, and uh, there's a lot of preachers uh, that eat there. And I've befri- we've befriended each other, many of them, on a first-name basis and uh, love it. And there's one particular brother that uh, we were sharing, many times sharing, talked about, you know, hot topics and gone to hot topics many times. And he sat down, uh, he came to my table, and uh, he was telling me about uh, what his denomination, it's a different denomination ours, is facing this next year, probably going to split the denomination about four or five ways. This confronting thing, it knows no bounds. This, this confrontation, he's splitting up whole denominations and his denomination is probably going to split about four different ways sometime this February and I'm listening to all that and somehow I don't know how this happened but we moved from that to a place we probably shouldn't have gone in politics but we'd gone there before and uh, this particular day you know usually it was him sharing with me but this particular day I don't know what it was but I was on a roll, and if I'm not careful, I got some buttons that can get pushed in this area. I try not to go down this road very far here, but uh, I, was, I was waxing pretty eloquent, and, uh, and he, he tried to interrupt. And uh, I was so passionate 
that I didn't want him to interrupt. Not, not only because I was so passionate about it, but I'm getting old enough that the distance between my head and my mouth is getting so long that if I don't get it out there, the idea just goes away and I forget what I was saying. So, so I say, no, just a minute, just a minute, let me get this out. And, and so I go another five or ten, and I'm just, wah, 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 you know, and I can get pretty passionate. Uh, I don't know if you knew that about me, but I do get a little passionate. And he, and he comes in and he said, just, and I said, just a minute, just a minute. And I went, I mean, three times he tried to interrupt me, and three times, ah, just a minute, let me get this out. You know, blah, 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 you know. And he's leaning, he leans a little one way this area, and I lean a little the other way. And, uh, and all of a sudden, in the middle of my big speech, where I'm just spewing out all kinds of stuff, he finally says, I've had it with this. I got other things to do. And right in mid sentence, my mid sentence, he gets up, walks out of the restaurant. And I'm going, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm a little ticked. Because in 62 years, I've never done that to anybody. And I've had my share come to Jesus meetings. I've never walked out on anybody. I've never treated somebody else like he just treated me. So I was a little embarrassed, a little ticked. But the third thing that I was, was checked in my spirit. And the Holy Spirit came in on me. And he reminded me, he took me back to a living room 30 years ago. Angie, go ahead. And I didn't want to do this. Everything in my <laughs> spirit was saying, don't do this. But the Holy Spirit was whispering, so you know what you you saw it then, and you need to do it now. So I got up, and I paid for my breakfast. I went in my car. I was supposed to come here. I set aside all my meetings. I didn't even come here. just called, said, cancel my meetings. And I drove to that guy's church. I went straight there. I got out of my car. I walked in. I'd been in that church two or three times. I thought I knew where his office was, but they had moved things around, so I didn't know exactly where he was. I, I went looking for him. I stuck my head into the sanctuary. There were some guys talking up in the balcony. I couldn't really tell. He might have been in that group, but I, it wasn't a time to talk to him in front of anybody. I couldn't find even where his office was. So I had to do the next best thing, which I just said, you never write a letter, but in this case, I wrote him a note, and uh, I said, Dear, and gave his name. I take full responsibility for this situation. It's my fault. I'm asking you to forgive me. Signed, John Ott. Folded it up one time, put a scotch tape on it. I found, the, I found it on this lady's desk. She wasn't even there, the assistant host or whatever. Nobody was there. I just took it off her desk and I, I stuck it right on the door so somebody would see it and, uh, and walked out. Next morning he wasn't there. Morning after that he wasn't there. Uh, he wasn't there the rest of the week he, it, to breakfast. And uh, caught, tried to call him. Left a message basically saying hey Hey man, I'm sorry about this. If I'd love to sit down and talk with you, give me a call. And finally, I emailed him because uh, this all the other stuff didn't work. And he emailed me back and he said, uh, "Hey, I'm I'm probably going to take a break from breakfast for a while, but I, I got your letter and you're you're forgiven. Uh, I'll be back." And and it took a while. It took him uh, a couple months. When he did come back, he was there with his wife, so I couldn't go there in front of her. But I finished my breakfast. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be as totally transparent with you as I can be. I wanted so much to walk the other way. I did not want to go to his table. I, I was going to go this way. And the Holy Spirit, no, you need to go this way. I don't want to go this way, but I want you to go this way. 
And so I went over there, and I called him by name, shook his hand, shook his wife's hand. Man, it's great to see you back. Been missing you, and, and walked out. And uh, he came back uh, eventually, caught him by himself. And it was obvious he really didn't want to talk about it. So just uh, one last time, shook his hand, said, hey, I'm really sorry. If you ever want to talk, let me know. And uh, for a whole year, I made myself go to that guy's table. For a whole year, it was a battle because I wanted to go the other way. But we were able to heal that thing, and it, it wasn't his fault. It's my fault. We got beyond it, you know, and we're talking preachers, you know. We're talking guys should know better, you know. It's even a battle for me. That one time, I went to the right place. I wish I could tell you here that I always go to the right place. But I battle it too. Right now, given what's going on in our society, there has never been a greater need for the world out there to see how Christians handle conflict. Never been a better time for our star to shine. Instead, our denominations are breaking up and our local churches are breaking up. I can't see any difference between the world and us. I am praying, I believe God is leading us into a, an exciting new year. I believe we're going to blow Super Sunday out of the water. I believe we're going to have people coming to Christ like we've never seen before. If the enemy's going to hit, he's going to hit now. In our church, in our marriages, in our families, in our communities, at our work and in our schools. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you to make a commitment. I'm asking you to commit that when you have to do Matthew 18 and this thing won't roll off your back and you need to do something, Holy Spirit's prompting you to do something, that you will do it face to face. You'll do it personally. You won't hide behind somebody or something. Are you with me? And are you willing to commit, if somebody even offends you publicly, that you will confront him privately? You will not confront in front of others. You will wait until it's one-on-one -on -one in a place where no one else is watching, where you try to bring healing to that relationship. Because you will strive not to win the argument, not to carry the day, not to attack him or defend yourself. Your whole purpose for doing this is to heal the relationship. And if you're willing to make those three commitments with me at church, at home, at work, and at school, then I'm asking you to stand right now.